Hi and good morning. My name is Pastor Adrian Shales with Hope of the Generations Church and Be in Health. And I want to thank you for joining us today to watch Ending the Addiction Cycle with Dr. Henry W. Wright. Addictions are a growing problem in the church as well as outside of it. Addictions aren't just related to things like alcohol or illegal drugs. Addictions are anything which control and rule us. They are anything that we use to continually attempt to soothe or comfort ourselves rather than resolve the source of pain. But with God's help, we can walk out of bondage to addictions and into freedom. This teaching will help you discover the real root causes that drive a person into addictions and give you biblical solutions to help you recover yourself from the snare of the enemy. Now this conference is around five hours long, but don't worry, we're going to be taking some breaks in between, but also make sure that you clear all distractions. Every part is important and you are worth it. Definitely other things can wait. And lastly, make sure you stick with us through the entire time because we will have some exclusive offers for those watching today. God bless you and enjoy. Well, good day to you wherever you are in the world and those that are here in person. I'm going to sit down today, if that's okay, and we're going to have a little fireside chat. No fireplace. Oh, well. There's a lot to discuss today. Please stay with us all day. After the Q&A luncheon today, I'm going to in invite one of our team members uh, to join us, we've been, I threw him some curveballs over the past uh, few weeks on some research <clears throat> because after lunch we're going to go into the, to the physical side of addictions. We're going to show you what's happening in your bodies and how the enemy is really trained you to respond. In fact, we're going to show you how the enemy has taken fear and turned it into a, a counterfeit faith which is the foundation for addictions, an expectation, but it's not good for you. So there's a lot to think about. Since we're dealing with a very tough subject, since all of our lives and our families have been impacted by some type of area of our life where we no longer are in control, we no longer are the had the power over our own destiny. We have good intentions, but how to perform it is ever escaping us. And so we're going to take a long journey. This morning, as we begin to get into this, we're going to look at some of the uh, biblical and spiritual aspects of this subject. And then this afternoon, we're going to drill down into biology and psychology. And then we're going to show you how that we, and actually I want to leave you with a challenge. Addictions are the result of us deciding to be a physical being and not a spiritual being. And your enemy is designed to get you out of the spiritual dimension. That's where God is. That's the real you. The addictions do not impact your spirit man. But your spirit man is trained to open the door for this type of bondage. And so our conversation of the relationship of who we are to God and who we are to the enemy and who he is to us. If you've got your head in the sand and you're saying, well, I'm just putting my trust in Jesus and you don't know the wiles of your enemy, you are easy pickings. Because the Bible says, be not ignorant, I'm quoting a scripture, be not ignorant of Satan's devices, his methods, his mythologies. I spent many years not just studying to the best of my ability to understand how God thinks, but I've also spent some time in understanding and looking to what he created, not just what he said, which is the word. Then I spent a certain amount of time, an incredible amount of time actually, and studying how the enemy does it. I want to know how he does it. I want to know how he accesses us. 
and how he can control us in spite of Scripture. Many people know the word, but are unable to walk in it. And I want you to open your hearts to why this happens. Now, we always think in terms of addictions as, as legal or illegal drugs. Uh, that is not the total totality of our subject today. There are many types of addictions that have nothing to do with what you ingest or take to take you into, and I'm going to use the word, altered states of consciousness. Biological altered states of consciousness to avoid who you are as a living, living being. You're a spirit. You have a soul and you live in a mobile home. Some of you have thatched roofs, some of you have no roofs at all. But that's your mobile home. Now this journey, and as I was pondering what I would say to you today, it was very difficult because how do we spend a full day talking about addictions and still keep our sanity? Because, because as I move through this, the enemy is going to come. If you don't believe there's an enemy that can speak to you, you're in the dark ages. Because the Bible is very clear that we have an invisible kingdom that is able to tempt us, is able to lead us, is able to influence us, and we are not to be ignorant of his devices. I found as an elder in the Christian church, the church is not spending a lot of time looking at how the enemy does it, but they're spending a lot of time in looking into the soul through psychology and through negative emotions and psychological defect, so that all of a sudden we are the problem. You are the problem. And if I can get you to believe that you're the problem, you're easy. Well, I hope today that we're going to take a good look at the fact you may be a victim, but you may not be the problem. Now, since you're not the problem to begin with, then we must remove the pathway that produces the reality that you became a victim and others around you. Now, as I was pondering this morning early, I, I thought, well, this is a crazy place to start an addictions conference. But I want to start it in Genesis chapter 3. Because I want to show you how the enemy eliminates who you are as a spiritual being. See, you don't see your spirit man inside of you. But that's the real you. When you die, your body goes back to the dust. Your soul and all your memories go back to the dust. But there's a carbon copy of your memories of your soul in your spirit man. There's a pathway between your spirit man and your soul. And it's activated through... Uh, <clears throat> through uh, pathways, and so, uh, in particular, theta brainwave activity carries thought back and forth between your spirit man and your soul. And so back and forth, you've got this transfer of information of things that you perceive through your five physical senses, and then things you perceive from within. For from within, Jesus said, for from within, out of the heart of man, Proceed evil thoughts and fornications and adulteries. So as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If I can get you preoccupied with yourself, I've got you. I have you right where I want you. If I can let you become preoccupied with yourself. Now, I want to show you how the enemy got Adam and Eve. Let's take a little journey back in the history book of time. Now the serpent, you know, there was the devil using the serpent as a vehicle of expressions. First case of channeling found in scripture. Who oh, it is. And the serpent was more subtle, more cunning. In other words, the serpent had intelligence. Your enemy has very skillful in overthrowing what God created. 
He took down a whole planet. He got one third of all angels to agree with him. There was a great war in heaven. He lost and they lost. But he is skillful in manipulating what God created through thought. Through thought. Now, you're stuck with a real problem. You think, hopefully. Or something thinks for you. You may not be in charge of your thought life. Something else may be. And you may have been trained to think wrong. And hanging out with the wrong people can guarantee you'll never think right. So you have to make some choices. You cannot defeat addictions without using your will. Don't think that God's going to come and deliver you against your will. He needs your will to win. But the will sometimes is so impacted by feelings and by biological upheavals and by withdrawals and by, 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 so that the will is suppressed and proper decisions are not made. God has given you the ability to make a decision. Even God cannot override your will. And neither can the devil and his kingdom. Now, you're going to have to understand what I'm saying. I don't mean to be so firm that, you're, that you go, what with this God calm down? No, your lives depend on what I'm saying here today. Your family's lives depend on it. You don't need to go to an addictions program. You need to find God and who you are in him. When you became born again, you didn't become a Christian first. Don't let them tell you that. Don't let them smoke you with that one. They were first called Christians in Antioch because they perceived they were followers of Christ. Do you think Christians are followers of Christ today? Are they doing what he did? Now, I'm just challenging you because you need to be challenged. Now, when you became born again, you became a son and a daughter of the Father of all spirits. You left, you became a new creature. The Spirit of God joins you or before it was, he was not with you. And you entered into a new dimension of eternal life, not prepared death. Now, either you choose life or you choose death. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very firm. Because I didn't come here to give you a plastic addictions conference. I want you to make decisions. If you're not making decisions, I'm wasting my time talking to you. If you're not dedicated to fighting for your own lives, who is? I want you to win this one. Can you tell? My, my fervor is I want you to win. Because he's given you your sonship, your daughtership. He's given you eternal life. He's given you everything at the cross. Why don't we appreciate it? And why don't we fight for mankind in it? And get out of this wussy Christianity. Get into where really the rubber meets the road. This is a battle for mankind. Don't even be afraid of it. Just step to the plate. I was, uh, I'll go to Adam and Eve in a minute. I spent some times in addictions programs in my time. I've been around a while. I've taught in some of the biggest addiction programs in the world as a guest speaker. I've been in, in and around it for years trying to help those that were addicted. And uh, years ago, I was in, in, in Dunklin. Like, like uh, at Lake Okeechobee in Florida, or Mickey Evans. Mickey Evans passed on to glory, but he ran one of the most successful addictions programs in the world, just for men. 
there'd be eight or nine hundred men there for nine to ten months. It was the only Christian addictions program in Florida that was authenticated by the state of Florida and had the highest success rate without recidivism of any addictions program in the world, around 90%, with no recidivism. And if you came, now I'm talking about will, and I'm going to give you some scriptures. If you came to Dunklin and you had an addictions program, you signed in that you would stay there for the full 10 months. Whether you were married or not, had children or not, you said, I need help. You're coming there. You're accepted. You came and you're going to stay. If you left and walked away, they would not let you come back. That's like a making decision between heaven and hell, isn't it? Well, some people can't make a decision between heaven and hell. They can't make a decision between things that represent heaven and the things that represent hell. They just can't make that decision. A double-minded human is unstable in all his ways. So if you left, you weren't coming back. And if you were addicted to drugs, here is their program, cold turkey withdrawal. I was with Mickey one day walking, and there was a young man in the way. He looked like a zombie in motion. I said, what's his issue? He's coming and he's in withdrawal from a particular drug. He'll come through it. Listen to what Mickey told me. If he decides to continue to exercise his will, he will come through the withdrawal. Now, when this afternoon, when I get Scotty Wahashi up here, we're going to talk about the biological thing. We're going to look at some things as to what gives power to painkillers. Because painkillers, the moment you take a painkiller, your body shuts down in the production of endorphins. And then it craves, but your body's no longer producing what God created, so you're stuck with a chemical derivative. We're going to understand and get into some of these mechanisms of the human soul, biological body parts, and how the enemy can cause us and manipulate us, and we're so easy. Are you tracking with me? So I watched this young man st stumbling along like the walking dead. Mickey said to me, you'll make it. In his present state, he didn't look too good. But Mickey had faith. He's going to make it because he's doing what he needs to do to, to face his enemy. Exercise of the will has nothing to do with your feelings. If you're moved by your feelings, you're not sons and daughters of God in the purest sense. The Bible does not say for those that are led by their feelings and emotions are the sons and daughters of God, does it? What does it say? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. But today, we're ruled by our emotions. We're ruled by our feelings. We're ruled by some biological manifestation of withdrawal, some biological manifestation of need to be filled, that we forget who we are. The church should have no problem with addiction, but it's just like the world. Why? We forgot who we were at the new birth. And we're acting just like we never were born again. But when we get around these Christians and say, well, I'm going to heaven. What about in between? It's hell. This should not be. This should not be. The cross prepared more for us than continued bondage, and then we label it grace. Are you serious? So grace has become a license to participate with sin. 
Are you serious? God forbid. Did you not read your Bible? God forbid. Adam and Eve. I'm getting on target. I've got to get my schedule here. You want to give me a five-minute warning? Are you up here? I hope so, because I'll talk till five and never stop. People are going to be doing this over here. I've got to go to the bathroom. Is he ever going to stop? I don't want to miss anything. It's good to be with the family today. Hello, family all over the world. God's family, sons and daughters. I'm reminded of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 5. The prophet Isaiah was speaking for God. And God said to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 5, My people have gone into captivity. Because they have no knowledge. And hell hath enlarged herself. Who? Against who? God's people. And hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And all of their great and famous people of God have been swallowed right up into it because they're duh when it comes to truth. You cannot expect to defeat the temptations and the impressions and the inspirations of Satan and his kingdom if you don't know God's word. You don't have an antidote. You don't need a bunch of pills. You just need one, the gospel. That's the beginning of the antidote. If you don't know God's word, you are stuck in your own world. Let God be true and every man a liar. You must have an antidote of thinking. But today the Christian church has become a bunch of country music style good feel things. We don't dare speak truth anymore. It might offend somebody. I am my brother's keeper. I learned that when the Lord challenged Cain. I am my brother's keeper. And when I got saved and the Spirit of God came to me for service on behalf of his kids, I became my brother's keeper. And I had a responsibility to represent God, not just in my own growth, but I had a responsibility that I'd been given truth and I was living by it. I needed to share it with anybody who wanted to listen. Because truth, and to know it, will set you free. So we got to have knowledge. And the prophet Joel, I think it's Joel chapter whatever, two or so, God speaking to the prophet Joel said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then God said, because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you and forget your children. That opens the door for a big subject called iniquity. We're going to get into iniquity this afternoon <clears throat> because even science is tracking what's coming into your generations from before you. They don't really understand it because science has a deficiency. I love science because it helps me understand what God created. But in spite of that, God, the, 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 the deficiency of science is it only believes what it can see. Now, they're seeing that thoughts can be inherited. They've known for a long time that your genetics can be improper. And you can have genetically inherited diseases. And genetic. So they've seen that genetics, there can be carriers of genetic defect that transfers from generation to generation. But they've also seen that thought <clears throat> will appear in family trees that was up, upstream. Now, how can thought be transferred? 
Thought is original to a being that thinks. You from the womb didn't know nothing unless you studied and learned. Did you not? You didn't have any any knowledge. You didn't you couldn't do logarithms at age one month. You had to be taught the process of mathematics. So how can thought come from generation to generation? Even in science, there's a new field, which people tell me lately I've been teaching it for 30 years and didn't know it. Uh, okay, that's good news. Is the field of epigenetics. What's the field of epigenetics? That thought, you've got to a gene that's not defective, it's not genetically defective, but it expresses itself incorrectly, producing a disorder. It expresses itself improperly. I learned a lot from the Bible, folks, about disease. I learned a lot. And I learned a lot of things, and one of the great tragedies of some of the newer Bible translators who are incompetent in their trying to give good news to bad men, but changing God's word, <clears throat> is they've taken the word iniquity out of the Bible, for the most part, one of the Bible translators, and just added the word sin. That's a different Hebrew word. So that's one of 3,000 errors that shows up. And <clears throat> what is the difference between sin and iniquities? Well, sin is what an individual does in transgression against God's nature and his word. That's what sin is. If God says you to forgive your brother and you don't, then that's a, and you for, have unforgiveness towards your brother. God considers that a breach with him and you. Because God's nature is to forgive. And if you don't forgive, how can you call yourself a son or daughter? I'm just asking the question because I want you to think. Relax. Some people are addicted to bitterness. The Hatfields and McCoys are transferred from generation to generation. <clears throat> so the word iniquity is different than sin. When you go to Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, it says the iniquities of the fathers. This is going to be big this afternoon. Because one in ten, and this is a statistic I have right in front of me, one in ten humans are carriers of an inherited factor that produces addictions. Genetically. One in ten have a defective gene. Alcoholism. I just give you some stuff I remember from research, just to get you thinking. The predisposition to alcoholism can follow family trees. There can be a child that is part of a cycle of families that are alcoholic. And that child, when it's conceived, has a defective biochemistry issue in the basal ganglia. It's defective. Alcohol is a drug. <clears throat> so you've got this incompetent family of alcoholics. Along comes jo <clears throat> excuse me, Johnny, at whatever age he is, and Dad's hitting the, so hitting the sauce. And he's, hey, Johnny, I'm a sip of bud, buddy. And the child takes a sip of bud wiser. The minute that alcohol comes into that child's body, there's a chemical reaction in the basal ganglia of two chemicals uniting, producing another chemical called THIQ. THIQ, which is a brand new chemical that was formed out of the connection between the Improper, biologically improper body chemical and alcohol. And that, that new 
chemistry in the basal ganglia called THIQ produces the craving for alcohol in that child, which will follow him into alcoholism. That father does not know that he just created another alcoholic. That's how stupid and dumb we are. I'm going to say it just the way I feel like it. That is not caring for your children. But that's how ignorant we are. So when it says in Exodus chapter 20, <coughs> good coffee. The iniquities of the fathers shall be visited, say visited, to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The God speaking. The iniquities of the fathers shall be visited to the third. And there's your rollover. There's your inherited genetics. There's your inherited thought. I submit to you that the thoughts that are inherited are not unique to the human species, but are the results of an, another kingdom of evil spirits that know that family intimately, was a source of their inspiration for generations, and all of a sudden the child gets thoughts that come through temptation, that he embraces, and there's no one to help him understand his thoughts. Because it's common to the failure of that family to thrive. This is the subtility of your enemy in his kingdom. He wants to be your inspiration and give you thoughts as if it were your own mind. And if he can control your spirit, man, and if he can control your soul, he can cause your body to respond improperly. We already know the mind-body connection is behind many disorders and syndromes. But we've never understood it at the depth of Satan's mind. We generally look at it just from a biological scientific standpoint. But we've never looked to the root cause, where did that thought come from? The minute I say, you know, Carl Jung at least had a little sanity in his insanity. Carl Jung. You know, he and Freud had some time together, and then he broke with Freud and went on his own, disagreed over something. And Carl Jung began to study human problems, psychological problems. And he began to see that there were things that were common to families that would produce all the psychoses and all the psychological defect and the syndromes and depressions and all the rest of it. And he coined, he coined a phrase. He went into some Eastern mysticism and he dealt into the world of contacting another world. He contacted some spirit beings. He called them spirit guides. One was Philemon, a principal. The other was Anima and Animus. He channeled for them. In fact, in his writings, Carl, I, have, I have Carl Jung's big red book in my office, the big red book, his dialogue with his soul. It's really interesting to read down some of the dialogue he had with his soul. What was speaking out of his soul wasn't his soul. It was another kingdom that had accessed his soul, spiritually and psychologically. Imagine talking to yourself and think you're talking to, well, here we go. So he began to journal or dialogue these conversations. He came to a conclusion that the biggest problems we have is this, is that we are the byproduct of the archetypes and dark shadows. Now listen carefully. This is right out of Jungian teaching. That most humans are the byproduct of their ancestral darkness. And he called that ancestral darkness the archetypes and dark shadows. Archetypes and dark shadows of our ancestral darkness. Jungian psychotherapy is quite dangerous. Because Jungian psychotherapy says in order for you to have a better life, you must come in contact with your archetypes and dark shadows of your ancestral darkness that you can understand your darkness better 
so that you can cohabit with it in order to have sanity and a better life because now you understand your darkness. The Bible teaches against this. The Bible does not ever teach you to cohabit with darkness. The Bible teaches you and, the, and God teaches you identify darkness and get it out of your life. Quit embracing it. So we're not going to practice Jungian psychotherapy here today, if you don't mind. Freudian psychology is on the rise. I'm quite concerned because Freud committed suicide. Who wants to be a follower of a man who commits suicide? You think he has something for your intellect? That's life producing? These are scary times. But because they're scary times, is because where I'm going, we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten what happened in the new birth. I cannot teach, now I'm going to tell you something, I cannot teach what I'm teaching now to non-born again persons because you have, new, you have no hope without God. It's not mind over matter. You cannot defeat Satan and his kingdom in mind over matter. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by his spirit. Saith the Lord. Am I talking to the choir? So, I go back to the Garden of Eden. What time are we supposed to break? Oh, I got lots of time. <laughs> Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Well, that's a, that was the, you know what that, that was the garden Bible, one verse long. Now we got 66 books to catch up in. Man, just give me, just me in the Garden of Eden. That tree, I'm leaving it alone, buddy. But here comes how addictions work. That's come as a wind this morning. As I was saying, God, I don't want this to be a clinical discussion on addictions. Everybody will fall asleep by lunch. I want it to be an impartation to bring decision in spite of my feelings, in spite of who I'm hanging out with. Let's go. And she said to him, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Well, God didn't say you couldn't touch it because you had to care for it, but you couldn't eat of the fruit. So she already didn't understand. Lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. I want to tell you something. The wages of sin are still death. Don't tell me, you grace people that say you have a license to sin now. Because of the cross, you can sin like hell, and grace covers you. You are in delusional thinking. You cannot play with sin and there not be a consequence. You cannot embrace what sin represents and think that you are still in full fellowship with God. The prophet would have, if you read your Bible, the prophet would have told you your sins, if you believe the prophet, have separated you from your God. Why? Because sin is a mindset that overthrows the purity of God's mind. Why would we follow inferior thinking? we just been finished an AI conference here out of a teaching I did a couple of years ago called His Ways Versus Our Ways. It's probably one of the best teachings. 
I think I've ever done because it drops a plumb line right in the middle of mankind and the church. His ways versus our ways. Are we really interested being sons and daughters of God of following his ways? How he thinks, what he would say, how he would act if he were us. I read somewhere, I think it was in Genesis, that when God created Adam and Eve to begin with, he created them in his image. What, what God has lost here in this Garden of Eden, he lost his image. He lost his image. And another image came into man's persona or his personality that was not God's purity of mind. So mankind became leavened, became mixed, became half-baked, because we embrace two ways of thinking. We became double-minded. <coughs> Excuse me, I got a little frog in my throat. Mm, that's good. You hear a lot of noises from me slurping on you. Well, I'll try to be coherent. You cannot exercise your will to defeat addictions if you are halting between two opinions. You cannot be double-minded. In one of the and I, I think I want to read this <coughs> in Luke twenty-two forty-two. I'll come back to Genesis in a minute. Let me put a little piece of paper here. And I don't want to just go so fast you didn't hear me. I want you to think. This may not be necessary for you, but it could help somebody that you love. Sometimes the Bible says a noble rebuke is better than secret love. If I love you, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm not going to, I'm not going to beat you up with truth. You're too fragile for that. But if I love you, I'm going to tell you the truth. <coughs> if I'm not honest with you, I'm going to lie to you. Excuse me, got to calm down. <coughs> Excuse this cough. Luke 22. I'll get over here in a minute. I know it's irritating to hear me cough, but get over it. You're just human too. 2242. This is when Jesus was about to die for our sins. Jesus the man, folks. And every feeling you and I have. And flesh and bone, nervous system, blood coursing through his veins. He was a human. <clears throat> and... And they came to the Mount of Olives. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And they kneeled down, they prayed. Then verse 42. Father, now listen carefully. This is big. If you be willing... Remove this cup from me. In other words, if you be willing, Father, and I don't have to die, that would be, would be my decision. And if it's possible, and it be your will, I don't want to go through this misery and all that's going to happen to me. Nevertheless, now here comes how you defeat addictions. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. If you're in the process, <coughs> in the process of defeating addictions, Nobody's asking you to die for the sins of mankind. You're not about to be scourged and beaten, pierced, hung on a tree. Nobody's asking you to die for God. So why should you die for the devil? Come on now. You have to... <coughs> Excuse me. You have to value your life. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. You have to make a decision that if God chose you, no one comes to God, listen carefully, no one comes to God, the Father, except the Spirit of God draw him. You didn't get born again because you're so smart. You're so intelligent. The Father sent His Spirit to get you because He loved you. Because He loves you. I need a box of tissues up here, please. Because He loved you. Wait a minute. Thank you so much, brother. Can't give a prophet a drink of water without receiving a prophet's reward, so I don't know what this is worth, but bless you. We're going to get into some tough stuff about addictions because all addictions, and I'm just going to drop you a one-liner, all addictions are rooted in the need to be loved. the need to be loved. And when you have unloving spirits that accuse you in your identity and accuse you in identity and say you're no good, you may have grown up in families around people that rejected you. You know what I say to that? Are you serious? How come God accepted you? Let's see who's greater. Humans that have rejected you or God who has accepted you? Who's greater? And let God be true. Yeah, but they re keep reminding me of my failures. Aren't you glad they're not God? They're not like God, because God forgives as far as the east from the west to the deepest sea. So why don't we track with God who forgives us? If you're making humans the source of your identity, you're in idolatry. The spirit of death has a right to you. To so get out of idolatry of men, they're just men, <clears throat> women. So what? You blew it. Big deal. I haven't found a Righteous human on the face of the earth except Christ. Including every Christian who goes to church is not totally sinless. But by faith, you're a pilgrims in progress working out your own salvation daily, allowing God to continue to form you in his image. Is that not true? It's the process of sanctification. I'm not the same Henry I was yesterday. I'm not the same Henry I was 10 years ago. I'm not the same Henry I was when I got born again at age 38 as a preacher's kid. Need to be loved. Genesis. I'm still there. And when the woman saw, now let me go to this. Herbert said, you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. 
and you should be as gods. Now, I'm reading from a Masoretic text here, which is little g, little o, little d, little s. Your Bibles that you have out here, depending on the translation committee, have made this capital G, little o, little d. Be careful, because if you're not careful, you put capital G, little o, little d, you would read this, then your eyes shall be open, and you should be as God, knowing good and evil. So you make God the author of evil. Just with one change of spelling. This is how subtle this gets in Bible translations. The word Elohim means gods, God or gods. If it's capitalized, it means divinity. If it's not capitalized, it means created beings. <clears throat> In one of the renderings about Moses, God said to Moses, I made you a God over the people. That's not capitalized. That's little g, little o, little d, made you a ruler over the people. We call the Lord, Lord, capitalized. I'm also known as Adon, Lord, little l. Sarah called Abraham Lord, but it was little l, little o, little r, little d. He was not divine. So if you understand and you have an interest in the purity of Scripture, unfortunately, the church is not taught how to read the Bible anymore, how to study. And the 100-plus translations that have come across the world have totally, have totally erased the purity of conclusion. So I like to follow the Masoretic text as a foundation, or as Doug Peck would say, Tyndall's 100 years before, because Tyndall and he was martyred for the Bible in English. Uh, Tyndall Bible, 100 years before the King James, is word for word the King James. So it came from the same manuscript evidence 100 years earlier. For those who want to argue about 1611, uh, take your best shot. I just upstaged you by 100 years. We get into these arguments. Quit arguing. Study. And so we get into the subject. So what Satan is saying, you should be as us devils. That's literally what it says. You should be as us devils knowing good and evil. Your enemy knows good. He ruled for good. In the old age, ruled by angels as Lucifer, Hallel. He ruled. He was, a, he was a cherub. He was an archangel. An exact counterpart to Michael and Gabriel. But he had a thought that came to him. He said, I'll be like the Most High God and began his journey. So, the first thing, the first thing that came to Eve was a need to know. Now, we're going to develop something this afternoon when Scotty joins with me, is how, how dopamine is released as an expectation to counterfeit faith, to give you a human conclusion that's not from God. Your enemy is skillful in taking what God created and using it for his advantage. We're going to delve into some deep stuff this afternoon. It may bore you. I hope it doesn't, because I want to show, we want to show you how it happens. How do addictions occur biologically? And why are opiates so dangerous? And we're going to take you right into the human brain and basal ganglia. We're going to show you the pathways that are activated. You're going to be shocked and at least challenged. So, <clears throat> the first thing that he offered her was something external, knowledge. God has knowledge he's not giving you. We have it. Now, when they ate of the tree and they disobeyed God's word, their eyes were opened. Is that not true? But what came into them was not good knowledge. What came into them was fear, guilt, and shame. What came into them was everything was Satan's nature because Satan now had a right to give them thoughts through theta, and they perceived it through, in the cerebral cortex, in their mind, 
and they followed these thoughts, they thought now all of a sudden they were evil, they were guilty, they were naked, they had to go hide from God, they had a fear of God. All of these thoughts that came to them did not represent God's mind, did it? So the knowledge that came was only evil. But Satan used good to open the door for evil, the need to know. This is, this is very strong in understanding occultism. And why are there so many false religions in the world? And why are there so many splits and denominations in Christianity? What a mess we have. Because somebody followed the thought. at the expense of other thoughts that would disagree with it. And so they took Scripture out of context, they ran with it, and here we have the mess. And so the first thing was the need to know. The need to know is an expectation of addictions. You may not realize it, but there has to be a pleasure return. There has to be a fix. There has to be an upper. There has to be something that elevates the person beyond their state of unloveliness to take them into an altered state of consciousness chemically that they don't have to face who they are in reality. That's the big snare to avoid yourself. Paranoid schizophrenia is not really a disease. It's a syndrome. It's not serious. Yeah, because all the paranoid schizophrenia is, clinically speaking, is a result of an over-secretion of norepinephrine and dopamine. We're going into dopamine this afternoon. That's a very big thing Satan uses in addiction, is the release of dopamine. Very, very big. So what happens in paranoid schizophrenia is a person grows up in an atmosphere that is not safe, uh, a home. Uh, they have fear. They disassociate. They, they create an altered state of consciousness to avoid the pressure of avoiding the uncertainty of the lifestyle in the home and so on. And so the body responds to the fear by over-secreting norepinephrine straight in the fight or flight. If you studied the GAS and fight or flight, uh, fear, anxiety, and stress, you'll find one of the first things that's released in fight or flight, either fight it or flee it. Now here we come into fight or flight. You cannot exercise your will to win if you're fleeing. When you look at the armor of God in the Bible, not, there's not one bit for your backside. There's not one thing for the back part of you. Because God never intended that you run from anything. He's giving you the power to overcome. But fear and other things, and lack of knowledge, lack of Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, lack of Scripture to give you the validity of fighting. What is the Word of God called? The sword. For it is written. Jesus himself defeated Satan. It is written. If you don't know what is written, you have no sword. All you have is a shield. You can't defeat the enemy just on defense. Jesus never defeated an enemy on defense. He defeated him on offense when he said, for it is written. And even Satan had to obey what was written. Are you tracking with me? I'm trying to give you tools. I don't want to give you just clinical stuff. You're going to have to fight for your life. Anything that, anything that you cannot lay down and how you think, speak, or act as an act of your will is your addiction. It's your affection. We're going to get some scriptures after the break. Your affection is your addiction. Where your treasure is, there's where your heart is. So if you want to live in a world of counter-reality or fabricated reality, you're not living what God created. You're living in an altered state of biological, psychological, and very little spirituality. The spirituality a person would have doesn't come from God or the Holy Spirit of the Word. It comes from another kingdom counterfeiting 
the need to be loved, the need for fulfillment, the need for the fix. <clears throat> the next thing that the serpent said, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, well, not the tree, the fruit, you don't eat trees. <clears throat> you know what this means, don't you? <clears throat> and that it was pleasant to the eye, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, did eat, gave it to her husband with her, and he did eat. Adam was right there when it happened. And he did nothing to stop it. He did nothing to cover his wife. Now you have to understand in these days, God was not a mystery to them. You, you apprehend God today by faith. You believe that Jesus, the living word, came from heaven, became flesh, became one of us, died for our sins, and is with the Father, waiting and he'll be back again. We all believe that because the scriptures indicate that. We believe scripture. <clears throat> but in this particular case, Elohim, capital G, little O, little D, the Lord, that would have been Jesus in his pre-incarnate state as the living word, the creator. He would come with Adam and Eve, and he would walk with them in the cool of the evening. How would you like to have the Lord come and walk with you in the cool of the evening? Wouldn't that be fun? It wasn't meaningful to them. They became too accustomed to what wasn't right and normal. So when we apprehend Satan's nature that controls our physiology and our psychology, we actually become abnormal in creation. And what is normal is suppressed. And what is abnormal is accentuated. So the real part of creation is now at the mercy of something called death. While the real source of life is suppressed. <clears throat> After the break today, I'm going to read you some scriptures about decision, making choice, that you'll have scriptures to learn how to defeat this. That was a fiery dart. <clears throat> Uh, I see your cardiovascular system's working. For most of you that are susceptible to uh, stress, your, your heart rate and your cardiovascular system return to normal in less than five minutes to relax. You'll be fine. <laughs> see how easy it was to take your piece? So I can still feel my heart thumping. It'll calm down. Don't worry about it. It's normal. Relax. So what Satan came and used was something external. They took their eyes off of who they were as spiritual beings and they put their eyes on a created being that was fallen not normal, and they believe the liar rather than the truth. You know, there are so many scriptures, and uh, we're getting close to a break, but I might want to move into it. I want to go to Luke chapter 11, verse 21 through 26, and I, I want to prepare you to understand this, this effort. I know that the human psyche is trainable. But I also know, if I read 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and 6 correctly, that even though your human mind may be filled with thoughts, not always good, that if you're interested in being a spiritual person, not led by your emotions or your feelings, <clears throat> that you won't be led even by your own impulses. Now, 
you were trained into habitual thinking. Habitual thinking doesn't happen just because you had a thought. Habitual thinking, which is the basis for addictions, is because your mind has recalled certain things and that thought's not just random anymore. Every thought that comes into you is random, short-term memory. But if you meditate on something over and over again, I want to just explain something to you here. If you have a thought that you, that you just keep, and it wouldn't be a good thought, over and over again, that thought enters into the area of biology. And through a process of RNA, this is a part of the DNA, we're going to get an RNA this afternoon and how it functions in addictions. Because as the RNA is the impulse to the yearning it comes on the RNA manifestation. But the RNA can be part of the DNA eventually. And so what happens in the, in the thought, that's why you're, that's why, oh, well, I'm trying to say something five different ways. Let me just say it this way. Is, is any thought, feeling that you meditate on over and over again habitually as a product of RNA will eventually become permanent. Listen, listen carefully, folks. This is a dangerous statement, yet a good one. Because every thought can be reversed or it can be covered by more truthful thought. You serve God with all the bad thoughts still there. But because you believe God's word and your bad thoughts come, you remember scripture that's God's word that's quite the opposite, and you begin to meditate in God's word day and night so that even though the other thought is there trying to speak to you, the Spirit of God is reminding you of this scripture over and over again that you've been meditating on, and your sword is active, and you cast down that other thought as inferior. I'm giving you clues. There has to come a time that you decide what is inferior thinking and superior thinking. No one wants to admit that they're duh. But if you don't capture your thoughts, you're duh. Because you're the victim of habitual thinking. You cannot take authority for your life and be an and be a addicted thinker to yourself. And do it. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 10, it says, you're to hold every thought captive. Every, every, every high and lofty, every emotion, you're to hold every thought, every thought captive. Every high and lofty thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and your obedience to Christ. And having in a readiness to defeat all disobedience after your obedience is fulfilled. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6 is key to decision. You're not to be led by your biological manifestations or your feelings. You will not die from a withdrawal. You won't. You won't die if you have to get sanctified in your thinking. But what you're thinking that's not of God could produce biological or psychological or spiritual death in you. It's your life. Take ownership. Take ownership. After our break, we're going to come back and give you scriptures about taking ownership. Take ownership. I was going to read Luke 11 before you take the break. Uh, Luke 11, let me get over here. Thank God my voice has come back. Prayer changes things. Luke chapter, I'm going to finish it. Luke chapter 11, verse 21, I'm going to finish. I can find 11. Here we go, I'm catching up with myself. 11, verse 21. Ah, here it comes. Here I am. When a strong man, verse 20, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he takes from him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. He that is not 
with me is against me. This is Jesus speaking. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scatters. Then it talks about the unclean spirit. It talks about the unclean spirit, and the one, the one before it has to do, uh, has to do with uh, a casting out of devils, which is a very uncomfortable conversation in Christian churches. They don't want to talk about it. They're scared of it, afraid of it. We don't have to worry about it. We're saved. We're not tempted anymore either. It's just psychological defect. I'm the problem. And so the first thing you know, there's not a kingdom there that speaks to you, only to sinners. That's the mindset of most of Christianity. They have this fear of identifying the enemy. Jesus spent a lot of time identifying the enemy, folks. And then he demonstrated that that kingdom was in humans by casting them out because they were the source of disease and bad thinking and even insanity. Read your Bible. It's all there. Why did we suddenly step aside? Because it makes us feel nervous. Why? Because we might have one of those critters. And we don't want nobody to know. They already know. They live with you. Come on now, have a little fun with me. You're going to have to decide the armor of your enemy. How does he get you? What kind of thoughts? Who is he using? That you can strip from his armor because he's trusting that you're easy. He's trusting that you are so easy. All he has to do is give you feelings, cause you biological manifestations, give you shivers and shakes, give you, and he'll come in the night with night terror. He'll keep you awake. He'll, he'll come and he'll speak to you. He'll accuse you. He'll, and the whole thing is a mess to capture you that you need to go into an altered state of consciousness to avoid the enemy. He's banking on the fact you'll never face him, you'll never strip him of his armor, and you'll never pursue him. He, he has mankind, he has the church, and he's quite content that you are that ignorant and hopeless and helpless. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. You cannot blame one other human for your inability to be an overcoming son and daughter of the living Father. You don't have one scriptural foundation for it. God's not going to honor you in your apostasy. Get up. Pick yourself up. Face the enemy. Let's go for the gold. Let's begin to have our minds renewed. Let's get our bodies back under the control of the Holy Spirit and truth and get out of this mix of falling so quickly into the manipulation of an enemy, even to our biochemistry. And it takes somebody to say, hey, I did this, but look at me now, I'm out of it, because all I did was surrender and say, hey, I need you. And he did the rest. It's like, it's really that simple. And for my life, did that for me. They assembled it. It's not so religious. It took the religion out of God and gave me who God really was, his character. And I'm grateful for that. <laughs> I am Jazz. Um, Floridian at heart, but now I'm from Georgia. My godmother told me about it. Um, actually, she, um, she said, you need these lessons, try them. And I said, well, okay, you know. And um, I think I'm still in awe <clears throat> on how <clears throat> God really works and how he works. And it's very mysterious to a certain extent. And he his timing, he knew what I was going through and spoke to her and she was obedient and brought it to me. So I I'm just grateful because I'm it's just, an amazing feeling. Um, I had, it started with mental, mental illnesses. Um, I, I showed, um, I was displaying symptoms of ADHD at first. And with the trauma going on in and out of my life, you know, uh, it wasn't, <clears throat> I was just very re rejected and unloved. But at the same time, I, you don't know, you know, you're just a child. 
<clears throat> going through the world and it's just like, well, somebody come and love me, you know? You, you, the people, your parents, they try, but if they have never been loved before, how can they display that to you, you know? So um, I was diagnosed with ADHD, uh, misdiagnosed for over six years with bipolar disorder, um, PTSD, major depressive disorder, um, anxiety, severe anxiety. Um, I was pres prescribed Xanax. Um, is this? But it's I believe it's more, but I don't remember. But um, I have a very thick mental portfolio, you know, and it's, it's like a phone book. And after a while, I came to agreements with those things because it's a doctor. He told me so. When I can't argue with the doctor, you know. So once I came to agreements, I was like, this is my life. And then I turned to uh, promiscuity, drugs, sex, and lesbianism. And from there, it was just really dark. Like for a while, I just didn't want to be alive. But I did know God and I know taking my own life is not part of it. So I was like, just here, you know? I was taking four to five medications a day to wake up, to go to sleep, to feel to not feel my anxiety, my panic attacks. It was just overwhelming. And for a while, that's, that was it. Like I didn't know sp spiritual, I mean, my, my um, things that I was with were spiritually rooted. I was just pushed medication, take this, you'll feel better. And then it's like, well, this is not work. Let's try this. Let's take this away. Let's add this. And I, and I got tired of being a lab rat. It had to be more. He spoke to me because in 2001, um, I was in a severe car crash. I was drunk, extremely drunk. And at that time I had a, a really fast Mustang, but um, long story short, I, I hit somebody going 80 miles per hour, less than 12 feet maybe, no brakes. And I hit him and I did a full circle and I hit a tree and that's where I landed. And I got out of the car and I, nothing was wrong with me, you know, and I got out, but I got out so angry and enraged. Then not even at hand of what really just happened. Like my life was saved. And that wasn't even the first accident. I've been in like three accidents, all self-inflicted. Um, I fell asleep at the wheel because I was um, intoxicated with drugs and alcohol at the same time. And um, really just a recipe, I just, I just wanted to die, but I know I couldn't, so I was just numb, really. And, um, but God said, no, like logically I tried and I tried. <sighs> but he wouldn't let me. And I'm like, why? Like, I wanna go and he was just, Sometimes you feel like he's so far from you, but now looking back, out of everything I've been through, I should be dead like five times already, but he saved me. And the things I don't even know he saved me from, I thank him. I remember I used to say when I was living in sin, wherever you lead me, I will go. And I didn't even know what I was praying. So that's how I know I had the Holy Spirit, but didn't know what that meant. It wasn't me saving myself. You know, it was him all along. So now I just feel like I say willfully indebted to him and I'll serve him because there's so many other people in bondage that they don't even realize that they're in. And it takes somebody to say, hey, I did this, but look at me now I'm out of it because all I did was surrender and say, hey, I need you. And he did the rest. It's like, it's really that simple. And for my life did that for me, they assembled it. It's not so religious. It took the religion out of God and gave me who God really was, his character. And I'm grateful for that. <laughs> it's just really, I just worry about the 24 hours at hand. So yesterday and tomorrow, I don't, can't do anything for me. God will meet me here today in this moment. So that's what I live by. And life is just full of joy. And I was given this 
It was painful. Every tear I cried. But I can honestly say thank you, Father, for the pain and the, for everything I went through because now I can share it with the boldness through the Holy Spirit. So that's my purpose. Now I know what I'm here for. Delivered. Any, everything that was sealed by the doctors have been unsealed by God. Everything I've, addiction, cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, sometimes I forget I even had those things. <laughs> and that's amazing to say it, but I would like to say the most overcoming powerful thing for me is the lesbianism because I really thought it would be the mental illness and the drugs and alcohol, but it's really that because my whole life I've been mistaken or I came to agreement with this identity and that's not even who I am. And I always knew, but I didn't know enough. So to say I'm delivered from those perverted feelings, it's like, <laughs> like I say, it's, it's iniquity. What can you do? It didn't start from my, me, my mom, them. It started from the beginning. So you just have to unravel, you know, and to be delivered and I am healed. I, I'm, I'm happy to say I am. Well, I could think about what I said because my my um, god mom, she was like, do this. And I'm like, well, I've already done everything. I've already taken all the medication. Listen to everybody. I don't just, I'll set it right here for a second. I'll think about it. But I just feel it is God's timing. But at the same time, if it wasn't for, for my life and being in health, and everything that I've learned, I would still be lost. I'd still be in religion, still be in my diseases, all of them, my addictions. And I'm just grateful to say the least. Um, don't be hesitant because what are, you, what are you scared of? To go back to the pit or do you wanna to fight to get out with the help of the only one who can get you out? You know, so how long do you wanna be where you are? Don't give up. Um, as dark as it may seem, as good as the darkness might feel, the light, <laughs> the light feels so much better. <laughs> um, when it's hard to breathe, breathe anyway. There's hope. And for a while, I didn't know what that meant, the true definition. But if, if you're presented with For My Life, it's because God chose you to receive the truth. And I, and I, and I recognize that. Like, so many people could have got that message, but he gave it to me and everybody else who's come. So there's a reason. And I also understand um, when they say disease isn't happenstance, right? So if, if it was planted in me to my brain to be the weakest part of me, then it has to mean that in the end, when I come out and walk out from for my life, my brain is gonna be stronger with the Lord. So it's, it's a reason. Do you know how many people that I have helped that would just weep, and I would just weep with them mm -hmm. until we were both spent. Mm -hmm. Neither one of us were the same person ever again. Amen. I never knew all of this stuff, so I've got a new life and I got a new relationship with my father, and that fills that that emptiness inside of me that I could never. I was looking for things to fill it and could never find it. I got healed from scoliosis, and I've had it since I was like 12. Van Health healed me from ADD. I've been able to open up and make more friends than I had before. Well, For My Life is one week of looking at your life and looking at your thoughts and looking at what 
is in your background, what's in your family history, and looking at why you've got problems in your life or why you've had illnesses. So it actually is a way of thinking about disease from a, a biblical or a spiritual perspective. And that allows you then to think, is your life actually in line with the Bible or is it actually totally out of line with what the Bible teaches? It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful cabin experience, you know, <laughs> and you get to hang out with really cool people. It's really neat to meet people from all over the U.S. and even from other countries here. The staff, the staff is at amazing. Being Hell is really, the oh my staff goodness, is amazing. you know, it started from on the phone, you know, mm -hmm. very engaging people, mm -hmm. and then to come and meet them in person and the way you know they take their time. They talk do. with you, you know, and um, give you their shoulder if you need to cry questions. on your shoulder. Yes. These people are so caring. There's no judgment. I have experienced love, compassion, acceptance of Christ through each and every one. All my life is life changing. Life changing. It's life changing. It's a change that other people can see. Take time out for your life. Don't miss the opportunity. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, back to back for my life. Mm. Ha, 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 ha. We're continuing our discussion on addictions. I know that this first session may have seemed strong, but when you're confronting the strong man, he needs to know your intentions. There's no way to defeat what you're in bondage to by pretending it's not a strong man. And there has to be a firmness. So I don't mean, when you're dealing with addictions, you're, you're dealing with one of the most touchy areas of human existence. Because it's touched all of our families and all of our lives. So there's no easy way to act like it's not a problem. And there's no easy way not to be firm in defeating it. So don't misunderstand if I become somewhat energetic. I'm not really, I love all of you, all that are listening. And uh, the Bible says the kingdom of God suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. That scripture has to be understood in the context of defeating addictions. God's people are suffering violence of the enemy. And the Christian church is not immune to this activity. So it's time to be violent against the violent one. Your faith isn't just inside, it's what you declare. And With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. It begins inside, doesn't it? For the heart, spirit of man, believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, here comes the declaration. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. We read this in terms of being born again. But salvation is more than being born again. You first must be born again. Then comes the process of of defending what was paid for you at the cross and apprehending it. And all of us are pilgrims in progress. We have our moments. We fall into our ponds of despair. We, we go three steps forward. We go two back. We fall. Yet the Bible says that the righteous fall seven times. They shall rise again. So we have these do you have scriptures like this to give you the understanding that God is not mad at you if you fall? 
But there's where you go to a fix. I was thinking about something at the break, about my own personal life, if I may just talk. I'm not promoting myself, I hope. But I don't need an upper. Nor do I need a downer to bring me from my upper. So I don't live a life that's a roller coaster of uppers and downers are, that are synthetically apprehended. I don't need an upper. You know why? One scripture. If you don't have the gospel pill, you'll need another one. If you don't have the gospel, you're going to need another pill. But do I live by one theme. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So the joy of the Lord is my strength. I don't need anything to get me up. I stay up. I have, I have learned how to overcome. It doesn't mean that I'm not tempted. It doesn't mean that the enemy doesn't come to see if I'm filled or empty. Because what I didn't read in that scripture there in Luke about the strong man, and it had to do with removing evil spirits, who was a source of inspiration for our personalities. It said even if the unclean spirit is cast out, even if that would be the victorious moment that the source of those feelings and thoughts were removed, doesn't mean he won't come back to see if you're filled or empty. The enemy really thinks you're easy. He really does. Because he's had so much success with humans. He didn't have to work up a sweat. And so even though we were victorious in removing the source of the temptation, the source of the inspiration, the enemy will come back to see if the house is filled. That's right there in Luke. Filled or empty. So you have to make sure that you don't go from freedom to freedom, but you go to a state of existence. You're not like a rubber ball bouncing off victories, and you're not prepared to face the enemy, because there's many areas of our life that need to be worked out. I mean, we're just having shop talk here, right? There's many areas of life that we don't deal with. We don't want to deal with it. So my, my, many of us originally are from Egypt. We go into denial. Uh, <laughs> and in, in teaching you about addictions, I don't want you to feel oppressed because we're touching the core of biological rejection. We're touching the core of of soulish rejection. Because when you ask a person to change, you've got your hands full. Because why? We're creatures. We're addicted to habitual thinking. But the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man or woman. But the end thereof is destruction. So, we have to really cleave to the understanding of what God created. Again, I, I said, and I was just thinking about this, is that if the joy of the Lord is your strength, you don't need an upper. And though I fall or trip, I'm not in despair, self-pity, or despondent. And many years ago, 2011, which is quite a few years ago, uh, when I was doing a conference in Trinidad, I had a major heart attack. Hey, I teach about health. Wow. And they told my wife when they called her, he will not live. She had to fly in from Atlanta to Trinidad, Port of Spain. Well, I, I lived. And uh, it's been a few years since 2011. 2019 coming up. And so um, I never lost my peace. Never lost my joy. In fact, one of the letters that was sent with me to whoever would take care of me in the aftercare when I got back to America said, let us introduce to you this most pleasant pastor from Georgia. Me, know, me being known as a pleasant pastor is a miracle. 
Because usually I'm so misunderstood in fighting for people's lives. I fight hard. And sometimes in fighting for people's lives, you have to really be firm. You can't be political. You can't be mealy-mouthed. You've got to be firm. You have to be strong when they're not. And sometimes that's misunderstood because some people don't want to change. I found people that really don't want to be healed, but they want attention. They're addicted to attention. They love it when somebody calls and says, well, how did you sleep last night? Man, they got their fix. Because they got attention. So who wants to stop those calls from coming? Get well, you know those calls will stop. Then you won't have your fix. Nobody calls me anymore to see if I'm well or not. That's self-serving, isn't it? One of the things I left you with in the break is the thing that Satan used is to get them to look on the external. Food, good the fruit, good to eat, good knowledge. Well, where is it? God's holding out. So long came this reaching out for more. And mankind has always been reaching out for more. Success is a black hole. Because when you, at the epitome of your success, you're not satisfied. Because you're addicted to success. And if you think success is a guarantee of spiritual and personal peace, look around. It is not. And so our, our source is in, is in God. You have to come there. Um, so I, I want to continue some of these thoughts. Uh, And talking about defeating the strong man, I want to take you over to Romans. And we, we have a teaching here uh, known as separation. Many of you may have heard it or been heard it taught in For My Life or have got the CD or whatever that I taught. But I'd like to take an excerpt from uh, Paul's writings in Romans 6. And I want to tell you why it's so important to be firm in your will. There's a big theme I've come up with today. Your will is your sovereignty. It was the thing that moved Satan even in rebellion against God. I will. I will. And I want to challenge you. Now, if somebody told you to go jump in the lake, you'd probably call the police. So they want me to jump in the lake and hurt myself. I can't swim. And so we will resist anyone physically, usually, that tells us to do something that's not good for us. Is that not true? You, you resist it, won't you? Yet invisible thoughts that come to you that don't have their origin in your own sight, but act as if they were coming out of your psychology or your mind, you fall right into it. And so you have a thought and you follow it. Why can't we treat the invisible enemy as straight on as we teach a visible enemy that we would resist? Your enemy is counting on the fact that you will ignore the invisible and be so concerned with what you can see. If he can do that, you'll be self-serving. It's all about you, your safety, your fulfillment, your wishes, your desires. And even though all of that is part of the faith picture and is good, it can be perverted. And so I want to take you over to Romans 6. And I thank God my voice has improved. Thank you for praying for me. 
Um, I want to read verse beginning of verse 12. Paul is the, is the author here. He said, let not sin therefore reign where? What's a mortal body? It, it's your body. That would be, that includes your physiology and your soul or psychology. That's your body. Does it say that sin doesn't reign in your mortal body? Does it say it doesn't? And listen carefully. We read sometimes the Bible like we drive the interstate. We get there, but we don't want what we saw. We miss the scenery. So let's not come to a conclusion and not understand what was said. Let not sin therefore reign your mortal body is a decision by a human to let not sin rule. It doesn't say sin is not ruling. It says the, and this is addressed to Christians, by the way, the believers, sons and daughters. You're not to let it rule your bodies. Now comes what? A decision. So when I begin the conversation today in exercising your will, no matter how you feel, because your body's going to pitch a fit. When you add, when you add things to your biochemistry, that are not part of the original creation of God, long term. Your body assimilates that biochemistry as part of creation. It biologically assimilates the fact that that drug or chemical is necessary for the organism to survive. And it will protect its dominion. It will crave now, why do you eat food usually? Because gastro juices begin to percolate and you have a hunger pain, right? Like I have one right now. Boy, it's sure telling me I'm hungry. But I'm not going to stop teaching you and follow that craving. Calm down, tummy. See, that's just a biological expression, isn't it? Do I have my flesh under control right now? Yeah, I won't die. I can live, listen, I can, I can live 40 days on just water and not die. So I have the faith of understanding that a hunger pain doesn't mean I'm going to die if I don't get a meal today. If I don't drink water, then that becomes a different issue because I need the water. I need the hydration. But I can live for 40 days and never eat one bit of food. How many of you have ever done a fast? I've done a 10-day fast. My wife, I think, did a 20-day fast. Some people have done 40-day fast and never, never just drink water. Uh, there are people in the Bible, Jesus included, that fasted 40 days. So they, they did okay. And so I'm not going to die because I don't get my fix. Are you? So my body is under what? Subjection. Now, when I did my 10-day fast, the first three days, I had a lot of hunger. Tommy growled a lot, protested, screamed, sang songs, growled. I mean, let me know he was unhappy. And uh, I, I just uh, just put it under subjection, drank water. And into the fourth day, the hunger pains were gone. You know why? Because my body decided that I was not going to cater to it. So it began to eat the toxins in my body and had a good meal. It loved eating all the waste byproducts in my body and did a great job. Now, the problem in fasting after 40 days is your body begins to eat actual tissue. And about day 63, you probably will, will die. So you have that period of time where you, your body's begin to eat itself, and that's not good for you, is it? So up to 40 days, you're safe. Your body's not going to waste away. You're not going to die. 
So because I say that, I'm confronting fear. I'm confronting body responses that that would would the enemy could use to make you shake and feel weak and and, and, and of course, if you have a sugar issue, you're going to feel weak anyway. You don't get your fix of food. So that, that's because you have a disease issue that's interfering with the fasting. We're not talking about exceptions here. We're talking about just basic understanding. So don't go here and there. Now, here in, in this chapter, in verse 12, it says, you're not to let. What is sin? Sin is a being. Paul taught us that in chapter 7. He said, it's not I'm doing it. I'm, I'm, when I do these things that I wish I would not do, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Read it, folks. Romans chapter 7. Paul said, I want to do good. I don't do good. I hate the evil that I do. That sounds like us, doesn't it? Paul understood our battles. Wow, that's good to know. I can learn from him. I didn't learn from him. And so, and so, he said that when I do this thing that's not good, that I hate, you know, sometimes people use food as an addiction because, and, and actually, those that smoke cigarettes and and if you if you're still smoking cigarettes you're relaxed you're not a cigarette but i have a right to talk about it and if i can't talk about it then i'll pretend it's not a subject we should talk about but it is people and now this is part of the studies even in psychology that it's not the cigarette even though there could be some complications from the side effects of smoking, nicotine, and all the rest of it. And it's certainly not good for your lungs. But apart from all of that, why do people smoke? They smoke because they have a need to be loved. When you were born, hopefully your mother breastfed you. Hopefully. A child that is taken from the womb and given to its mother who begins to speak to it, talk to the child, nurture the child, love the child, and breastfeed the child. Medical statistics state this. Asthma is prevented in that child at an average for the first six years of its life. What is asthma? We found asthma to be fear of abandonment. What causes, what causes the, the uh, inflammation and the compression of airways that take in oxygen and let out carbon dioxide? What, what produces that restriction? It's mind-body connection. It is a type of fear, a type of anxiety. And so we've learned that over the years in, in studying and in case histories. So, so we, we have an individual who was not nurtured properly as a child, may have inherited the insecurity of abandonment in the family tree. It may have been generations of families that did not know how to love their children. There may have been dysfunctional families. It's all part of this. We get into the thing this afternoon on, on, with Scotty on, on some of these things. We're going to find uh, life, life circumstances that affect us, that produce a predisposition to addictions, to escape the reality, the feelings of not being loved. Um, so a child is designed, now I don't mean, I, we have a mixed audience here, so I'm trying to be, you know, a teacher. Is, is God designed the breast to feed a baby? Period. True? Good. Good answer. So, if God designed the breast to carry milk to feed a child, and by the way, if a child is breastfed, it has antibodies and so on that are given to it 
that protect it from many infections. It, it's, it, it's built into the immune system response. And uh, so we, we, we get into this, and the child learns to hear voices. That's why when, you, when a child has colic and you start screaming at a child, you think the child had fear going in? You got this big monster speaking a language that doesn't even understand, making faces and growling and screeching. And of course, you're going to have more fear. And you're going to have more colic because colic is fear based. So we, we just don't understand. And so we fall into these traps of response. So you are designed, these lips, that's why people that uh, overeat and, and go into binge eating and go into all these types of uh, overindulgence, it really is a need to be loved. Lips. These things are good for kissing properly. Smooch. It's perfect for learning how to bond. Bonding. The the nurturing of a nipple of a mother, bonding, belonging, acceptance. So what happens is a cigarette, the person is, uses a cigarette, it's the lips. It's the sucking. And I don't mean to offend you, but it's a, a substitute for a female nipple. Now, this is the psychology and the spirituality of it, folks. I don't mean to offend you, but this is my field. This is what I know. So just indulge in me. Don't be offended with me. It would be better if you used a binky than a cigarette. You could suck on something. I did a conference... <laughs> I did a conference years ago in Dallas at the Mesquite Conference Center. And I was teaching on addictions in the morning session about you'd be better off if you had a binky rather than a cigarette. So we came back from lunch, and we had about seven or eight smokers that had got together after the teaching. This is funny. They got together after the teaching, and they went out somewhere, and they bought binkies with a little thing of pull, pull tabs. And, and when, I, when I came in to teach in the afternoon session, they were sitting on the front row, grinning, all with binkies in their mouths. I had a friend years ago that smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for 40 years of his life. He got born again. He was convicted that that amount of smoking was not good for him. But he, he just couldn't couldn't lay it down. And so I got to talking to him about the need to have something in your mouth. And he was in the construction trades, and he was, and he was a foreman. So it would have been very unfashionable to go to the job with a man with a binky in your mouth. <laughs> and he said, I can't do that. <laughs> well, I said, no, I'm not asking you to. So he got to thinking, this is where you take ownership for. This is a great story. It's a true story. This is where the process of you taking ownership for your life. He got, in fact, he put together a program for anybody who wanted to get it from him. He had a little tape. I introduced it, and he recorded it, and he gave a little, a little you, you get a tape. I think it was for 20 bucks you could get a little CD. And back in those days, it wasn't a CD. It was just a little cassette tape. And you get a little booklet to help you overcome smoking. And a jar of cinnamon-flavored toothpicks came for 20 bucks to help you overcome smoking. And what he did, he, he bought some of these, because he got the concept. I need some, I need, I, I, and he told me, my life was horrible for my child. I don't know what nurturing is. I didn't know how to nurture myself. I didn't know how to give nurturing to my, growing up with wives and children. I, I, was, I was just, I'm a checkout. But now I, I'm awakening. You know, it's never too late to awaken. I said, it's never too late to change 
and embrace the kingdom of God in your life. Don't say, I'm too old to change. The enemy wants you to say, I'm too old. It's your life. True? Then make it your life. So he got these toothpicks, and after a meal, he would put a flavored cinnamon flavor. Those things were hot. I ever had them? They're pretty good, but they burn your lips at first. He'd put this cinnamon toothpick in his mouth as a substitute for the need for a cigarette. And in a short period of time, he weaned himself off the cigarettes. Now he was addicted to toothpicks. <laughs> Not really, because as he moved along, he realized that the toothpick and the cigarette and the binky were giving him the same comfort that he was missing all of his life. And that comfort that belongs to you should not be found in toothpicks or binkies or cigarettes or anything else you suck on. But that comfort should be from God. That when you became born again, your Father in heaven accepted you as a son and a daughter. You have to embrace this. You don't need a placebo. You don't need an artificial comfort. You don't need an altered state of consciousness. You do embrace from the inside that you're accepted of the living God. That's the beginning of becoming a spiritual person again, not just an external person. You're being led by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, not your feelings or people around you. I see many people, including myself. Now, I didn't get saved last 38 and I'm a preacher's kid. That tells you something, doesn't it? We won't talk about those 20 years as an adult separated from God. We won't go there. I'm glad, I'm, not running. I'm glad I'm not running to be a Supreme Court nominee. How about you? You're glad you're not running to be under that kind of public scrutiny from your past or in childhood? Let's not talk about the scriptures that says flee youthful lust. I guess there's no provision for fleeing youthful lust in our Congress anymore. We're stuck with our childhood even though we've changed. That's a serious defect right now in America. There's no place for forgiveness. Just accusation. We're all sinners. They're all sinners. He is without sin, let him cast the first stone. That's what I do if I went to Congress. I'd pass out bags of stones. That's what I would do. I don't know why our president is not doing it. Just start passing out bags of stones. And everybody would go and have to rethink, wouldn't they? Well, that's my political statement. Or is it? So I want you to think about how, how patterns develop, like the need for nurturing, the need for this sucking mechanism, the need to be loved. One of the biggest defects we have in the world that is core to addictions. Now, there are many, we're not talking about prescription drugs necessarily. We're just giving a general picture here, okay? Because there are specific physical disorders that are very painful. And, and we'll get into that maybe later as is as, as the bridge. And how can, you, how can you make sure you don't live on the bridge? I, I have to be careful I don't take a stand against all pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, but pharmaceutical drugs all have a side effect. And illegal drugs have their own problem. So we're not going to get on the bandwagon here and begin to thump you. It's not worth it. It's just going to drive you to more. So let's be thoughtful how we begin to reevaluate our life. Could I be productive here today? that you could have the hope. You can begin your journey of coming out of addictions while you're still addicted. 
If you're waiting to be free of addictions before you start trying to be free of addictions, you're wasting your time. <laughs> well, when I'm free of addictions, then I'll say I'm free of it. Then I'll, I'll pursue being free of addictions. Now, you're going to, that like the guy down at Nicky Evans' place in, Lake, in Dunklin, like walking like a zombie coming out in withdrawal of some kind of drug. I mean, the guy didn't know what day it was. He could barely stumble along. But Nicky looked at him and said, he's going to make it. That's the faith you need to hear. You can make it. You can do it. Didn't say it was going to be easy. The devil never makes it easy to be free. He's a strong man. We read that to you this morning. He's a strong man. And he's relying on everything he can put his hands on to make you feel insecure and unloved. To give you a fix. That you don't need to face yourself and knowing that you are important, that you are special, that God, your Father, does love you. He didn't send the Holy Spirit to get you because he didn't like you. In fact, he loves all of mankind. He's no respecter of persons. And all of mankind are really God's sons and daughters, but they're separated from him because of following lies being trained by the enemy. You were called out of that, were you not? You were called out of that, were you not? But being an overcomer didn't say it was, was going to be easy. I've told people for years, I'd rather be weary and well-doing than worn out from losing. Let me say it again. I'd rather be weary and well-doing than worn out from losing. In the overcoming market, count me in. Because when you're not pursuing overcoming, you have no faith. And this afternoon, you're going to learn that drugs is a counterfeit for faith. Because there's a release of dopamine that's supposed to be tied to faith, or an expectation of promise, that is replaced with a counterfeit. The external, not the internal. So, with that, I get to talking here too much. I won't say anything. Let not sin, we found from chapter 7, that sin is a being by its fallen nature. Now, the church doesn't teach that, but they didn't read chapter 7 of Romans. Though those that did say, well, Paul's talking about himself because before he was born again. When you're reading Romans, that doesn't what they say because they don't want to have to face what Paul is saying. The church is not one to admit it has stuff to deal with. Now, it's very obvious Paul's talking about himself while he is born again later on in this chapter. So it's a very shallow conclusion to exempt yourself from the obvious instruction of an apostle who is not only sharing with you truth but aspects of his own journey of overcoming. I like an apostle that admits that he was weak, but he became strong. I like an apostle who admits that he had sin, but he could overcome it through Jesus Christ as a work of the Holy Spirit. That gives me hope. It takes me out of the, dis dis the disillusionment of thinking, disillusional thinking. It takes me out of denial and forces me to face an enemy that I look straight square in the eye that I cannot see and say, you will not rule me anymore. I'm in charge now, in Jesus' name. I'm in charge, not you. This has to come from a decision, an act of your will, does it not? I know I'm not... When I got born again, I was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. I didn't have to light one. I just lit one off the other one, or it went out. I sound like the Chattanooga choo-choo train going down the road, <gasps> wheezing through the day. And when I decided, when I got born again, that that element of my life had to go, because... I just had to make a decision. It was not easy. I still have a chipped tooth from chewing hard candy. Right here. 
in that first week. Right here, bottom two, chipped. Because I still needed to suck something. Are you with me? I still had the insecurity. I still had the need to be loved. Even though I'd become born again, I had not had the maturity to walk in it. I understood it. I accepted it by faith. But it takes time to go from point A to point Z. It's a journey. Is it not? But the journey must start somewhere, sometime. And that week was rough. I'd buy them and throw them out the window. I'd light one, throw it out the window. I'd put it down, I'd throw it out the window. I'd chew candy. I'd... It was a war. Because I had to have some security. I begged God to deliver me, and he didn't. You know what I got out of that? God can't deliver me of something that I enjoy and won't make a decision about. I had to, I had to understand the sin. I had, I had to understand Romans 6. I, this is the sanity of overcoming. Right here. It needs to be taught in the Christian church. This gives you the faith to take the faith of one man who became an overcomer that you can join him in his journey. Because God is no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he'll do for another. But we don't, we want to be fixed because we want to sometimes use God as a drug or as a placebo. We want to be fixed, but we don't want to take the decision to retrain ourselves in righteousness. We don't want to have time. I'm going to read some scriptures this afternoon in our closing about some instructions about overcoming. But I have to tell you, Proverbs 25, 28 says, he that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Everything just comes running in and out. I must, now, this isn't ruling my mind, mind over matter. This isn't soul, body, management, or control. This is, I have to make a decision in my spirit, man. That's where the Holy Spirit is, living with me. I have to come into agreement with God, the Holy Spirit. I have to come to agreement that what God created and what he said is correct. I have to make a decision that God is true and I'm a liar. I have to make a dis decision that I'm tired of being deceived. I'm tired of being a puppet on a string by an invisible kingdom. I'm tired of my physiology being controlled by thought and feelings and emotions. But while I'm making this decision, I'm overtaken by the same. While I'm in the middle of making these great decisions from within, trying to rule my spirit, all the other stuff is still there. Demanding my attention, demanding I listen, controlling me through thought. You talk about a battle? So you had to make a decision. You want to be free, you want to be managed in bondage. What do you want to be? Do you only really want to be free? He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Perfect peace belongs to them whose minds are fixed or stayed on the Lord. And who is the Lord? The living word of the Father. So my peace and my upper, I don't have uppers. I have steadfast journey. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Regardless of circumstances, regardless of what the enemy says, God's word is true, and I must believe it, but no, I must be a doer, not just a hearer. It's easy to quote people's scripture. It's a different way to live it. So don't Bible, and I'm not trying to Bible thump you because you'll just go down under. You know, 
And then you just will. I, I cannot drive God into you. I can't make you change. I can't free you of your addictions. I can give you tools of understanding. I can show you pathways of freedom. I can give you understanding. But there is a time that you must come and embrace Romans 6. That you're not going to let what things that are a sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it. That you should obey it in the lust. That word lust doesn't mean sexual. The word lust here is meant whatever you set your affections on. Whatever you set your affections on is your addiction. Whatever you set your affections on, I'm addicted to God. It's a good addiction. I'm addicted to life. It's a wonderful addiction. I'm addicted to truth because to know it is the basis of my faith. That's a good addiction. What is this addiction? It means whatever you set your heart on. So we're back here again. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. It doesn't say you don't. Now here is the, the balance of Paul. He's saying, yeah, there could be a case in your life, Christians, that you're letting sin rule you and your members. There could be a place that your members are being used as instruments of unrighteousness. It's, it's possible because we're all somewhat half-baked. Romans chapter 7, Paul said he was half-baked. What an apostle, a half-baked, honest apostle. I love it. A spiritual leader that says, I understand God and I understand the enemy, and I'm a pilgrim in the middle of overcoming, and I have my good days, I have my bad days, but in the days that I do these things that I wish I would not do because I hate them, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells. Look at the word, dwells within me. If you went back to Luke chapter 11, and dealing with a strong man, Jesus is very clear. In order for the strong man to be defeated, he first must be removed. Something stronger than him must come upon him. But then begin to strip the armor that he trusts. What's the armor? In the case of addictions, it's unloving spirits, not feeling loved, feeling rejected, bitterness, fear, anger. This is the armor the enemy is using to make you feel like you don't belong here and that you're not loved. And, and you can't handle it because you're designed to be loved. You're designed to give and receive love by God because God is love. And if you're created in his image and you're his sons and daughters, then you're to be like him. Give and receive love. If that's voided, you're tormented. The tormentor has come. And he's trusting that he can keep you living in the past. He's trusting that you can believe that you're no good, that nobody loves you. He'll get you to all times of all the states of consciousness and performance and perfectionism and pride and drivenness. He'll take you into fabricated personalities. He will form you in his image to keep you from being that simple son and daughter of God that you really are. Keep it simple, smarty. Don't complicate this one. You should not struggle with yourself any longer. It's a sin. You can hate the things in you that are not of God. Paul said, I hate those things that I do that are not of God. I hate it. It's okay to hate sin. It's okay to hate, but you cannot hate yourself because you are not sin. I said you may be serving sin, but you are not sin, folks. Are you listening to me? So quit making yourself one with sin. Quit going down under even parts of your personality that are not of God because it really is not you.
you're under the control of another kingdom that is living vicariously through you at your expense. Why would you let these spiritual parasites live through you as part of your personality? Their spiritual parasites are part of a fallen kingdom under Satan, and they have no life except through you. Allowing them to live vicariously through their fallen nature. Are you? That is what is in Luke 11. Now, I don't have time to preach you the whole Bible. And I know I'm being pretty forcible, but I want you free. I'm not going to sugarcoat this with, well, I'm so sorry, Jesus loves you. Grace covers, you know. So in doing so, I authenticate your bondage as something from God. I'm never going to do it. I'm never going to say your bondage is permissible and acceptable to you because in doing that, I will not love you properly. I will not ask you to go into Jungian psychotherapy. I will not ask you to, be, to cohabit with the darkness of your ancestral past or your present and call it life. We're going to remove it. You get our minds renewed. By the washing of the water of what? The what? That's easy. But most, most Christians look at the word like you drive the interstate. See that tree over there? Which one? The one over there with the pretty bark. We are not taught to be doers. Sometimes we're Bible thumped. I hope I'm not Bible thumping you. It would not be my heart. I would not want to make you feel unclean by my teachings. That wouldn't be my heart. The unclean spirits are unclean. I'll nail them. But you guys are so that's all. Because you're not sin. But Paul is very clear. You should not let it rule you. You, you have authority here. You have a Magna Carta. You have a power that you're not using. The Father and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit are right there to work with you in being an overcomer. If you'd let them work with you, you don't have to do it by yourself. Well, it feels like I'm doing it by myself. The enemy wants you to think it's you. Anyway, let's read more. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, the grace, if you look at the word grace, the word grace is, uh, is taught in Christianity as unmerited favor. That's not the meaning of the word grace in the language of the Bible. Unmerited favor came from the 1700s from Webster's Dictionary. The true meaning of grace is also found in Webster's Dictionary that matches the Hebrew and the Greek. But the, some of the theologians in the 1800s didn't like the Bible. They didn't like the word. But they like Webster's definition and they took Webster's definition and made it scripture and what you what you have from it is unmerited favor grace is God's unmerited favor which means even though you're serving sin it's okay it's all right grace covers the true meaning of grace, if you do the word study, and it's found in Webster's Dictionary also from the 1700s, 1800s, 1800s, is this is the true definition of grace. And it's found, in the, it's found in, the, in the word study of the King James. And it's also found in Webster's Dictionary. Hmm. 
God's divine influence on the heart and its reflection in the life. Grace is God teaching you what you need to know. God wants to influence you. I'm trying to influence you on behalf of God using scripture. So grace, you're, you're, this is a grace teaching. God wants to influence your human heart and how it reflects in this thing called life. Mercy is a measure of time to figure out what he said. So we're in the dispensation of grace, God teaching us, mercy, measure of time to figure out what he said. And aren't you glad we have that dispensation of mercy? We're not under the law. We're under grace, God teaching us, mercy, time to figure it out. That would be a correct understanding of the word grace and mercy, and there will be this, those that disagree, and that's their problem. Let me finish this. I got a few minutes. Yeah, okay. Let's see here. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Worse, they were. <laughs> but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. So you didn't start believing in your soul, which is filled with all these fears and thoughts and stuff. And with your body, your body doesn't think, by the way. It's a responder. Your body is dense. But it's a responder to thought. But your thoughts can be inf influenced from within, either by God and his word and the Holy Spirit, or by another kingdom who gives you thought. Spirit to spirit, both cases. And you're to decide which voice to follow. That's 2 Corinthians 10, 5 and 6. Review it again if you'd like. So, being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Now, I wanted to run on down here and uh, read something else here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, here it is. Verse 16. Know ye not, now this is key right now as I finish before lunch. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. What does that mean? Whatever becomes your master, you become its servant. Either to sin unto death or God, or righteousness, or gone to God into righteousness. You have to decide who is Lord of your life. Do you want that other kingdom to be your master? That means you're a puppet on a string. That kingdom controls you through the external. It speaks to you from spirit to spirit, but it manifests in your physical life. That's why addictions are all in the physical dimension. It's that thing on the tree. It's that fruit. It's that need to know. It's, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that, it's that. And everything is self-fulfillment. And you're told it's a blessing from God to be self-fulfilled. It is unless it's perverted with false promises. Because you cannot offer God and sin at the same time. You cannot offer righteousness and unrighteousness as biblical teaching as a multiple choice answer. You have to decide what unrighteousness is, what righteousness is, and you have to decide what your personality is going to include. You decide what your personality is. But that's going to take, that's going to raise some smoke. That's going to create some conflict. Because we're creatures of habit. Our, our, the, the ways of sin, the ways of wrong thinking that produce the need for addictions is not only temptation, it's ingrained in your long-term memory because what happens when you meditate on something over and over and over again through a process of RNA, that thought becomes permanently part of your biology. I said permanently part of your biology. So the law of sin is in your members. Now comes the law of God, which is the opposite, 
You're going to meditate on the Word of God day and night so that through the process of protein synthesis, the Word of God, which is the law of God, not the law of sin, but the law of God, is now also permanently part of your biology. Now you've got both laws. That's what Paul said, in my members I have two laws. Paul said, Romans 7, in my members I have two laws. I have the law of God and I have the law of sin. So with the flesh I follow the law of sin, but with my mind I follow the law of God. This is your journey. You cannot defeat addictions unless you understand this journey. Because you're going to be compromised in the old law. It's right there. It's part of your personality. It's right there to make your body. It's great cravings. It's there to, to get you into, you know, denial. It's there to take it. So you have to decide whether you're a physical being. And listen as I close. In order to be free of addictions, you have to be dis decide, are you a spiritual being first or a physical being first? If you decide you're a physical being first, you have lost this battle. So we're going to teach this afternoon in biology. If you decide that you're a spiritual being first, you can win this battle because you've got two laws. You've got this law competing with the law of God. You've got this law speaking to you how awful you are. You've got this law that says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The hand of God is upon you. You are an apple of his eye. And you're going to cast down the inferior thinking you're going to bring up the superior thinking. You're going to follow the superior thinking, and that makes you an overcomer so that you can be in charge of your life again and not a puppet on a string. Hi, everyone. It's Pastor Adrian again. I hope this conference is beginning to open your eyes to how a need to be loved is at the root of addictions. But there is hope because we can be delivered and learn to accept and receive love from the Father. Then we no longer need to look outside of God for a fix. Now maybe you're taking massive amounts of notes and are wondering, can I take all of this information in? Or maybe you're thinking, I have someone I love who really needs to hear this. Well, if that is you, I have some good news for you. The complete teaching you're watching right now is available in CD or MP3 format. This is an excellent item to purchase to share this message with others or for your own review. Today only, you may purchase it along with all other Be In Health resources for 20% off until midnight tonight. Now earlier, you saw the video highlighting our For My Life retreat here in Thomaston, Georgia. It is an amazing week and totally life-changing but we understand that not everyone can make it to Georgia, and that is why we have created the For My Life online retreat. If you cannot make it in person to come see us, this is the next best option. At our For My Life retreat, you will learn the biblical precepts and tools that will help you get free and stay free. There are thousands of testimonies of healing from all manner of disease as a result of the biblical information that is presented and the Holy Spirit working with everyone involved. For My Life takes one week to complete in person, but online we give you up to three months to complete the course. Today only, we want to offer it to you for $100 off. Just click the link below to register, and with that, we will see you in a couple of hours for the next session. I think having the For My Life program online has been kind of a dream of ours because, you know, not everybody can come here at this time or any time. Maybe, maybe you're too sick or, or maybe just your life circumstances won't allow you to do that. I don't want you to think you're, feel, you're being cheated because you're not able to come here. God will meet you in a most amazing way. But the For My Life online to me is a very intimate time with the Lord. What I mean by that is, you know, some of my greatest breakthroughs with God have been in my prayer closet, or it's been I've heard something or I've read something in the scripture, and I didn't have the distractions of anyone around me 
to be able to thwart maybe what God was wanting to do in my life. It's also a time for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you things of your past that brought you to the present and, it, and, and he, that He can be able to speak to you and convict you and show you things that maybe you've never seen before. Because I know that when you hear these teachings, you are going to hear things that, yes, you may have read so many times or maybe never, but, they're, the, but, but God's going to ignite something in the times that you hear this. And you are going to be able to just totally surrender to Him, vulnerability, and also humility. Also, too, because you're reflecting on the past that brought you to the present, we also give you hope for the future. The thing is, is that before God, He begins to ignite things in that be still and know that I am God moment, where He shows you, oh my goodness, I have tools to overcome forever and ever. For as long as I'm here on this earth, I can overcome. So I really hope that you consider taking the For My Life online, not for us, but for you.